Good evening, Hope Reform Baptist Church. If you're new, we're very glad that you're here. Uh, a word of encouragement for uh, the gentlemen uh, yesterday who are... Uh, uh, anybody here that was here yesterday at the uh, uh, men's muster? Yeah. All right, good. A bit of an encouragement, especially to those of you who uh, feel like you're terrible singers and the Lord would never use you in that way. I've heard just a uh, testimony this morning that one of the neighbours on the street that we were uh, singing to the Lord on and preaching on, uh, woke from a daze, a non-Christian, hard, hard kind of background life. He woke in a daze on a Saturday afternoon as we were singing, and he said, I thought I was in heaven. That's pretty good. And then he uh, went down just this morning and spoke to the, uh, our hosts from Saturday and said he's been reading his Bible now and he's uh, very interested and he wants to, he's interested. We're praying for him. He got a tract and we're praying that he comes along to church, right? Yeah. Amen. He wasn't even there. He was off in the, in the wilderness and the Lord uh, is using that. So it was a great day yesterday and we're jumping into the book of Judges tonight. So can you please turn to your Old Testament and we will be in the book of Judges. This is uh, probably not going to be, I assure you it won't be, a particularly word by word, line by line study, like for example, our Hebrew study is going to be, and some of the other uh, 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 book studies that we do that are expositional, but still, we're looking at understanding and pulling from the text of Scripture themes for obedience in our own day. I do, I believe, uh, have to, probably legally, I have to do an official warning before we start this book. Um, it is not safe for work, don't share this on Facebook where your HR staff are going to be following you or seeing you or do and organize another line of employment. This is not a politically uh, a correct book. This is not an acceptable book. I'm surprised that the modern evangelicalism is still printing this book in the Bible. Uh, it is filled with violence, sin, polygamy, assassinations, rape, theft, idolatry, and all kinds of judgments from God. Largely, this is a book, this is basically, this is how we can summarize the storyline of the book of Judges. God's people colonized an area and didn't kill enough of the original inhabitants. Yeah, that was a nervous laugh, wasn't it? <laughs> can we summarize it that way? Is that a bad way to summarize it? Yeah, of course, that's an ultra-triggering way to summarize it. Is it true though? Yes, we're going to see in the text, God judges his people because they don't kill enough people. No amens? All right, we'll get there. We'll get into it. You're nervous. You need to relax. God uses, in this book, without apology, he uses sex addicts, warmongers, womanizers, cowards, hotheads, proud men, idolatrous men, very sinful men. Yes, and women, uh, but the, the guys really get the uh, show off their bad end of the stick. So don't look down. Here's the test. As we study the book of Hebrews, you want, you think that the application is going to constantly be, aren't they a bunch of scumbags? And, and we have spiritually progressed and we are all holy and perfect. And sadly, because they didn't love Jesus and color in uh, Noah's Ark picture, they're not going to go to heaven, but we will because we're meek, mild, and gentle. And then you go and you read the book of Hebrews and you get to chapter 11 where Paul just says, these guys conquered, they served God by faith. Really? These guys, are, that he just names them in Hebrews 11, some of the worst. He names, I think it's Gideon, who was a coward and an idolater at the end of his life. He, he mentions Samson, a total womanizer, coward, uh, abandons his marriage, Right, And then there's Jephthah, who human sacrifices his virgin daughter. And Paul just puts it into Hebrews 11 and said, the things they did, they did by faith. It, well, but not everything by faith, right, Paul? Yeah, yeah of course, not everything by faith. But, but the book of Judges tests you. It tests how pietistic you are. It tests how proud you are. It tests how sensitive to the world's uh, sensitivities and desire for gentleness you are. It tests how, though, proud and self-righteous you are. If you can't look at these guys and go, I belong in the book of Judges. I know raising fists and who has for that. But if it's a confession, you go, I would fit in in the book of Judges. That's me. That's me. I'm a sinner. I'm, I'm, I'm perverted. I'm compromised. I'm naturally an idolater. If you can't do that reading the book of Hebrews, uh, reading the book of Judges, and then read the book of Hebrews, which says, but they did some things by the faith which saved them, and that faith was placed in Christ alone. If you can't amen that, you're going to do some soul searching, my friend, and I'm very glad that you're here. This book tests 
us and it really tests how much we have been discipled by the soft age that we are in. Right? Hebrews 11 says that some of the people, well, many of the people uh, in this book that we read and, and just are amazed and sickened by their acts, we're told that we're going to see them in heaven. So can you imagine the day of the great uh, host of heaven marching into glory and you talking to each other and you say, you're a saint, I'm a saint, here we are. Well, what's your testimony? What would you do for Jesus on earth? And one of them says, I buried a large dagger into the bellies of an obese king and his bowels and excrement covered him in shame. Soli Deo Gloria. (laughs) Okay, that's cool. And you start getting some, you start shaking. You go over to the lady. She looks very nice. You say, what did you do? What's your testimony? She says, "I, I drove a large tent peg through the temple and brain of an enemy king and drove him, he became, he became a mantelpiece, uh, a, a, a coffee table sort of a, 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 a implement for me and my household. I killed him. Praise be to Jesus. <laughs> you go, you're shaking, you go, all right, and what'd you do? And some guy goes, we're going to read about this one tonight. I severed the toes and the thumbs off of a king for Jesus. And you go, all right, now it feels like you're at a weird, nutty family reunion with all of your cousins from the bush. And you're just, and you're like, wow, I, I taught kids. I taught, t- I taught kids in Sunday school. We never colored in your stories. I don't remember you uh, in these lessons, but they're right here. They're in the book of Judges and we're going to look at them, I think, and I hope and I pray a bunch of teenage boys will get converted through this sermon series. When I was a young kid, I got given a uh, disgusting and violent Bible stories for kids. I don't know that it was edifying for me and my natural inclinations, but it was interesting at least for me to learn and realize the Bible has ugly, real history all throughout it. It doesn't uh, 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 smooth over and iron out all of the harsh and horrible things in history. It accepts it. God takes responsibility for it and says, I'm sovereign. What happens, happens by my decree. What I wrote down I wrote down. That's what God said. He breathed all of this book into scripture. He didn't have to. He didn't have to, it could have happened and him not written it down. Why did he write it down? Because somehow this glorifies Jesus and it's good for us to learn about it because it will exhort us to faithfulness. That's what the New Testament says. This is some of that scripture that Paul says, all scripture's good for you. Get it in here. So here we are in the book of Judges. Our four questions as we look at the book of Judges each week. Now, tonight's introductory and looking at historical background. Next week and the following weeks, we're going to zero in on individual, uh, sometimes cluster them together because there's not really uh, all that much detail for each one. But we're going to be looking at specific biographical sermons going on. Tonight's mostly background and historical explanation. But each character that we study, even tonight, we're going to ask four questions. Number one, what happened? Let's get some explanation because you read it and it's not written like a Western novel or it doesn't appear before us like a movie. So so we want to go through the actual historical details. What is it that's happening in this story? Secondly will be, how does this exhort us to faithfulness in our day? How does this drive us onto obedience in our day? Thirdly, we're going to ask, how does this part of the story advance the overarching story of God's redemptive in and through history? Why is it in the Bible? What has this got anything to do with God saving sinners in the long run? Uh, And fourthly, we're going to ask, how does this story in some measure point us to Jesus Christ? They will be our four questions as we study. So let's do some history. I'm not going to go page by page, but we're going to start back at basically the beginning. In Genesis, after the fall of man into sin, God kicked him out of the garden, and the uh, uh, sons of Adam and Eve spread over the face of the earth, and they quickly, in short order, began to commit heinous and horrible, vile sins and crimes against the Lord God who made them, but they, that they didn't know religiously because he had not revealed to them how they could be saved, and in their heart of hearts, they ran after sin. God showed us what every generation deserves in our own right by flooding an entire world in that generation and then receding the floodwaters uh, 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 in Noah's day to remind us that's what we all deserve. 
Have you ever read Genesis and you look at Sodom and Gomorrah or, 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 or the things happening in Genesis 6 and go, that looks like the valley. What's wrong with that? Why doesn't God flood us all? That's the point. We're living under grace. That's the point of the rainbow. So after that uh, global act of God's judgment, yet showing us grace, then time would go on and God would find an individual who was unworthy, who was a pagan. He was uh, basically in Chaldea in the area of Ur. His name was Abram. He and his wife were barren. God would eventually call them to himself and make promises to him unilaterally. I am God. I made everything. I'm not one of the idols that you're worshiping over with the Chaldeans. Newsflash, I'm bigger than that. I'm going to send salvation to the world and I'm using you. When, Abraham, when Abram expresses faith in those words of God, it says that he, there, he thereby was, was counted just and righteous in God's eyes because he believed God's promises. And he believed that God was able to do whatever in the world he was promising to do because he's God. And that simple trusting faith justified Abraham and God changed his name from Abram to Abraham and his wife's name Sarai to Sarah because that has God's name Yah embedded into those names. And he took ownership of them and entered into relationship with them. Part of God's promises to the world were through Abraham and part of God's promises to Abraham were for the whole world. And he said, I'm going to turn you, though you're old, barren and a pagan, I'm going to turn you into a Yahweh worshiper, a father, and in fact, a huge nation. And he makes him have a, a child. There's a couple, but one child of miraculous promise uh, who then has another child. So we have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob's name later uh, gets changed by God to Israel. And Israel has 12 sons who uh, become the patriarchs or the heads of the tribes of Israel. And while they are just still a 70-person family, uh, um, uh, famine strikes. They go down to a metropolis called Egypt. What could go wrong with this? Egypt has a lot of grain and men with swords, but a lot of grain. And then quickly, the Pharaoh jumps on top of the Israelites and enslaves them all as they multiply in number. 400 years go by and they are a thriving population under the grip of this satanic man, Pharaoh, with a snake on the top of his head. How's that for some spiritual imagery? And God miraculously raises up Moses, who, will, who by God's power uses miracles and threats and, pa and shows of God's strength to dismantle the divine uh, pleroma of Egyptian gods. And basically, one by one, plague by plague, God topples the areas of worship that the Egyptians accounted to their gods, so that finally, after killing their firstborn son, Pharaoh says, you can leave, take the Israelites, I want nothing to do with them. They leave, Pharaoh chases them, God kills Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea, while saving his people, the Israelites, and a bunch of Egyptians that came with them, through the Red Sea into the wilderness. Being there, he gave them laws and he gave them commandments and a system of worship and then told to them that you can go by my power, just as I destroyed Egypt, I will also, in like manner, clear out the opposition, wipe clear the table of all of the inhabitants of the land of Canaan, the promised land that would soon become known as Israel on that strip next to the, uh, on the east of the Mediterranean Sea. And God had promised it. Just as I did that, I'll do it again. Just believe in me. First trial, they go up to the edge of the land. They do not believe in God's power because these guys are too tall. God was okay with the miracles and the ocean splitting in half and all of that. But tall men, this was going to be God's Achilles heel. And for their faithlessness, and we see their faithlessness, because these men were too tall for God to beat and the Israelites had no hope, uh, therefore God killed that entire generation in the wilderness. He waited for all of them to die. And then he took their children. How's that for an object lesson? Walk past your parents' graves and then to the edge of the border and we say again, do you trust me to take the land? And they said, yes, yes, we'll do it. It's okay, we trust, we go. And so un, uh, Moses could not enter the land. He died before they crossed the Jordan into Israel. But Joshua uh, was a campaign military leader. 
And Joshua, after Moses, God used to lead the Israelite tribes across the Jordan into, uh, basically from the northeast, into the land of Israel. And they began their campaign for the Lord God to obtain and inherit the promises that God had made to Abraham and which God had made to Joshua about which tribes could live where in this uh, land currently inhabited by pagans, but that God will give to them. And Joshua is large, there is some discipline there, but it is largely a story of success as Joshua leads these uh, tribes onto military victory, clearing out their enemies, largely the Amorites. Joshua, 20, uh, Joshua ends, and I'll read you this in chapter 24 of Joshua. You can flick over one page there if you wish. Joshua concludes with <coughs> uh, this um, exhortation on his deathbed, basically. He brings the whole nation together and says, verse 20, If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord. What are we going to do? Worship false idols? No, we will serve the Lord. Verse 22, And Joshua said to the people, Well, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, yes, we are witnesses. He then said, put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, the Lord our God we will serve and his voice we will obey. This is like uh, high levels of optimism. They were excited about taking the land. They believe the best of themselves because we the people have constituted to be faithful to God. And we're not able to break our promises. We're good Bible-believing Israelites. But they didn't have the power in and of themselves to hold that covenant up. They didn't have the, the, the power within themselves to turn away from false idols and turn away from false religions and thereby... Stay in covenant with God. The book of Deuteronomy, especially chapter 28, God outlines through his prophet very clearly that if you honor me, I will protect you. And you will be high above the other nations. One man can go out against a thousand and he will send them running. I'll bless you in the home, in the yard, in the field, in the street. I'll bless you everywhere. But he uses this parallelism where he then flips the script and says, but if you serve other gods and break my laws, then I will curse you everywhere. A thousand of you will go out against one man and run fleeing. I will curse you in the bedroom. I will curse you in the home. I will curse you in the kitchen. I will curse you in the street. I will curse you in the yard. I will curse you in the field. Nothing will escape my judgment if you turn away from me. That's the blessings and curses of the Deuteronomy covenant. The, the, the covenant that God made at Sinai repeated in Deuteronomy before they went into the land. When we get to the book of uh, Judges, the faithful Joshua, who warns the people, do not walk away from God, he dies. The end of Joshua says this. Chapter 2 in the book of Judges says this, that Joshua then died. And all of the men who were his elders and his leadership, they also lived faithfully and kept the nation walking with God. And then they died. And then after them came up a generation who did not know the Lord in the way that they had, who had not seen the mighty works of God for themselves, and they eventually drifted, they compromised, and God brought the Deuteronomic curses upon them as we saw. By the end of Joshua's life, which is the beginning of the book of Judges, there is no centralized government in Israel. There is no centralized, what we would call a standing army. There's no paid military. There's just farmers and Israelites uh, across the country that if there's a threat, they have to quickly get together to fight. There's no centralized military or leader or in the language of the book of Judges, which repeats it multiple times. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Right? They're postmodernists. They've read the Enlightenment thinkers, and they know that there really is no objective truth, and it's an act of oppression and tyranny to claim that there really is only one way to God, system of right and wrong, and religion. That doesn't go with our coexist bumper stickers. They read all those books, and God killed them for it. He's doing it again. 
In the book of Judges, there is no king, and the king ultimately in the Bible produces two things or provides two things. First of all, an example, a holy, godly example to follow, or if it went wrong, a terrible, idolatrous example to follow. But in their best days, the king was a good example to follow, but also a protector from their enemies. Israel had no king, so they had no good example And they didn't have a particularly smooth system of protection from their enemies. Here's the big question that you have in your mind as you come into the book of Judges. Will they prove Joshua wrong? He said they couldn't do it. They believed in themselves. Will they be able to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, take on the foreign gods and demons and stay true to the law, uphold it all, earn the blessings and will God wipe out the enemy inhabitants of the land before them so that they can obtain the promises of the land allotments that God told Joshua and of the prophecies and promises that God made to Abraham? Will they do it or will they fall, sin, commit idolatry, turn to other gods and suffer God's curses and consequences as we read in the book of Deuteronomy? That's the big question. Now, you know your history. You know the answer. But we're going to see it in Judges' words. So let's look at what the... We're going to basically cover chapter 1 and 2. Not all the words. Not all uh, uh, word-by-word exegesis. But we're going to basically cover uh, the first two chapters. So look at verse 1 of chapter 1. After the death of Joshua... The people of Israel inquired of the Lord. This is a good start. The the main leader's dead. They go to God and Yahweh. They said, what should we do? This is a great start. They say, who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? This is a faith-filled start. This is very positive and very good. The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. Judah at this time is an entire tribe, not just one man. And Judah said to Simeon, his brother, that is another tribe, come up with me into the territory allotted to me so that we can fight against the Canaanites. And I likewise will go with you into the territory. So they formed an alliance. They're going to work together. Uh, Simeon was a smaller tribe within the much broader a broader allotment of, um, of Judah. So this was making strategic sense. They heard God's word. They made plans. They worked together. Verse 4 says, Then Judah went up, and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand, and they defeated 10,000 of them at Bezek. You know what you've got to get get used to, right? Because you you can read this like a Bible story, and and you can sort of just see the veggie tails dancing around, and it looks very cute, (laughs) and we're about to make some very spiritual applications. This is real war. Was there 10,000 image bearers of God that God handed over to bleed into the grass and sand by his own will and command, and then he smiles upon it because Judah and Simeon did his will? Yes. You all should have answered that. Yes, God commanded war. Real war. It wasn't prayer war. It wasn't a prayer room. Sword war. Death war. Destruction war. 10,000 of them at Bezek. God commanded this war because it was more, of course, it was more than just a political war, right? Uh, when you read the Old Testament, people, people ask the question or they think of him today, you know, would God really ever, would he ever judge, right? And does God really ever command war? Now we're in the Old Testament. But there's a book that has the name Judge on it. It's very obvious the answer to that question. And in the first four verses, he's blessing them because they're killing enemies. Yeah, this is still the God that is yesterday, today, and forever absolutely the same. This does not mean, hear me say this, this does not mean that any war is the right spiritual war, that any war is as equally spiritual as this. Of course, this was a particular place and time, but ultimately what God was doing was using his people Israel as the the sword against the pagan nations to judge them for their sin. Canaanites had been sinning. Abraham wanted to go into Canaan and God said, no, leave it, wait, I will give them mercy. 400 more years of mercy. Your great, great, great grandchildren will come back. I'll see how they're doing then. The Canaanites had continued to eat their children. 
sacrifice babies to their gods, uh, 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 commit slavery, mass murder, and false demon worship. And by that time, God said, their iniquity has reached fever pitch. It's judgment time. I will send in the Israelites. And though it looks political and geographical and merely military, it is actually spiritual as we read it in the book of Judges. And so they go in to do what is obviously an ugly, gritty piece of history. But this is good for us. History is ugly. There are pretty parts. It always comes after war though. There's beautiful moments in history. It is largely horrendous and horrific. Largely. True history is truly ugly. Biblical history is like biblical levels ugly. You ever heard somebody use that expression? It was biblical. Like it was, the uh, highs were high, the lows were low. Judges is biblical level ugly history. But it's true history. God's word for you tonight is deal with it. Deal with it quick, because there's a whole book of it, and we're doing it nonstop. <laughs> the only way of moving on from this, not dealing with the ugliness, is to either lie to yourself about the purity and the blessedness and the flatness and the uh, holiness of all of history. My people have never done wrong. Uh, uh, oh, the world really is a beautiful place. Everybody does well. You can either lie to yourself or you can re remain naively ignorant, and that will produce what we call hagiography. That's like you write a story about somebody and they never sinned. You know, they, they were just a perfect saint and it's all their positives, none of their negatives. The only way to arrive at that is to lie to yourself or remain naively ignorant, and God in his word doesn't lie about the truth, and he's not ignorant of man's actual sins. So it's really good for us to read a book like Judges, especially in our day, because that kind of naivety breeds a cowardice and a fragility in the church that makes the church immensely feminine and weak. The church as a whole becomes immensely weak when we don't deal with the reality and the truth of history, which is the only history that God has been working in for his glory. Now, in verse 6, it gets, basically it tapers off and the rest of the book is a lot more calm. So it says this in verse 6. Adonai Bezek, the king, fled, but they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. Oh, I lied. It gets worse. It gets constantly worse, and that's the point of the book. It keeps on getting worse. They severed his thumb so that he never hold a sword again. So basically, they, 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 they disarm him. They shame him. I don't know what they did with the thumbs and the toes, but that's what they did. And they took him back to Jerusalem. And his response is, yeah, I had this coming. Uh, this, is, this is on me. I've been doing this to 70 other kings. Eh, caught up with me. There you go. He's a, he's, he's a real man. Uh, he's just, <laughs> he gets it. You know, this is war. I get it. Uh, but here's the big point. At this point, it's, though ugly, it's very positive. It's very positive because it's talking about Judah. Now, what you don't realize on first reading is that the book of Judges is a piece of propaganda. It's propaganda. It's good, divinely inspired, Davidic propaganda. It makes the Benjamites look bad, and it makes the Judahites look good. Why? Because at the time of the, of the events, there's no king in the land. At the time that it's probably collated and put together, Who's the king in the land? Saul the Benjaminite. He's not doing good. And who's, who's the other party? Who's the right-wing party that the conservatives are trying to put in, in, in power? David from the tribe of Judah, who has received promises after the anointing of Samuel and apparently much better things are going to come through David than what we're experiencing under Saul. But very likely this book came about in that era so that we see Judah is doing good. He comes in with Simeon as his right-hand man, like Batman and Robin, and they kill everybody. They chop off their thumbs. It's great. And then they, that was hilarious, came up with it on the spot. And, <laughs> and Judah is presented as a covenant keeper. He's killing the right guys. He's faithful to God. He's trusting. And his angel sent. They said, who goes first? And the angel of God said, make it Judah. This makes Judah look very, very good. The failure that comes into play is over in verse 20. Look at verse uh, 20 of chapter 1. 
and Hebron was given to Caleb as the people of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites. So the Benjaminites are shown as the failures. They did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites have lived with the people of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. That's propaganda. Who do we blame for the two-state solution? That there are those gangs over there, the Jebusites, in our holy city, and that there are the Benjaminites. Who's to blame? It's, the, it's Saul's people. Who ends up taking Jerusalem, ultimately casting out the Jebusites in an amazing feat of military victory? David. This is all pointing to God's purpose to enthrone David, pointing ultimately to the great son of David, Jesus Christ, the Judahite. But what we see here in the rest of the book, so Judges chapter 1 has so far been, Judah was winning by faith in God, Benjamin failed, and then we see in verse uh, um, uh, 20, 27 onwards, we see great and mighty spiritual compromise. This is what we need to remember. At this point in Israel's history, it looks military, it looks political, it is deeply spiritual. God made sure they understood that in Deuteronomy. If you don't worship me, you'll get a, a, a downturn in the economy. Fuel prices will go up. People will keep killing their children in abortion. Uh, ignorance will go far and wide. Uh, true religion will be persecuted and put to the side. The economy will fail. The enemies will come in. You'll be invaded and forgotten. It's not just political, he was telling Israel. It's spiritual. We see this, what looks political but we'll learn is spiritual in the rest of chapter 1. So look at verse 27. He just goes through the rest of the tribes. Judah did well. No one else did. Manasseh, verse 27, did not drive out the inhabitants. Verse 29, Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites. Verse 30, Zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants. 31, Asher did not drive out the inhabitants. Verse 33, Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants. Verse 34, the Amorites pressed the people of Dan back into the hill country and they did not allow them to come down. Dan was driven and became basically gypsies in the trees because they couldn't come down into the land God had promised. Failure, failure, failure because they didn't have faith and they didn't trust that the God who had driven them out of Egypt could bring them into the promised land. God uses the enemy as a punishment against them for their spiritual compromise. So we see here in uh, verse uh, 11 of chapter 2. Look at verse 11. Uh, sorry, verse 1 of chapter 2. The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said, all right, leaders meeting. I'm calling a time out. I'm calling an audible. Come meet the angel. He starts cracking the captain's heads together on the sideline. What are you doing out there? What is happening? I gave you game plan. I told you what to do. They're handing it to you out on the field. Is what they say. The angel of the Lord says, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore I would give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars. Rent a forklift. Lift their altars onto the fire. Get a steamroller. Ground their idols into powder. Stop tolerating them. Stop Coexisting with them. Tolerance and diversity was literally why God was killing his own people. That was their sin. Tolerance, diversity, coexistence, and pluralism. Right? The, the furry guy wearing bunny ears in the office, he said he didn't like how we pronounced him. Uh, so we, we compromised. Okay, now my people will all be killed. That's God's response. That's the modern equivalent of what's going on in Israel. What happens in the church? He says, I would never break my covenant with you and I told you to break down their altars. What is this that you have done? So now I say, you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? Verse three, so now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall come, come, become thorns in your sides and their gods shall be a snare to you. God's literally telling his people, I'm letting the demons destroy you now. I'm giving Satan more freedom of religion because you refused to do what I commanded you to do. 
the presence of the enemies and the influence of the enemies was not merely historical, it was spiritual. It was not merely political and militaristic, it was a spiritual judgment from God. This reminds us that yes, God was judging the inhabitants of the land for their idolatry, but God is not, he does not pick favorites. Even his people Israel, he punishes for their idolatry. So God is showing here, he is involved with his people. They did not press on to obtain the promises and they did not trust him to be the same that he's always, he had always been and so he introduced judgment. And there's so many similarities in, a, in our day. Uh, this is kind of the mindset that the Israelites fell in. Let's not just stand back and laugh at them and their folly and their silliness and their cowardice. Let's put our hand up and admit sin and pray that God protects us from this. We're in a day when Christians are soft and wonder why their worldview is not respected. Christians are cowards and wonder why they don't see gain in the kingdom. Churches tolerate heresy and pluralism and wonder why God closes them down. Christian leaders start their service with acknowledgments of country and then wonder why they're so spiritually impotent. Churches look to the government to ask what they're allowed to say and if they're allowed to stay open and which people they're allowed to bring into the congregation building and what things they have to do to ensure safe spaces for people and then wonder why God opposes them and gives them into the hand of the enemy. Some churches are lectured by men in dresses whose political ideologies is to kill more babies, and they wonder why God is not blessing their ministry. There's a denomination in Australia, I laugh or I cry, and they had this whole state meeting to decide on a matter, or at least talk about a matter, that their doctrinal statement was already clear on. Can women preach the gospel and be pastors in, the, in Reformed churches? The book's already said no, the confession says no, Paul said no, that's enough for me. But they came together to discuss how we might express this in 2023. And the night before they had their general annual assembly, somebody called Workplace Health and Safety and said they don't feel safe with this conversation happening. And so the, the whole meeting of the denomination was cancelled until we can ascertain a committee to decide what other words or timings or situations or, 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 or uh, 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 details that we might be able to ascertain so that we don't offend or make anybody feel unsafe. That congregation, that denomination needs to close down and do nothing else but read the book of Judges for a year straight, then dare to reopen. That's what they need to do. And they wonder, why are we seeing dropping numbers among young people and especially young men? You know, it's so confusing, isn't it? If, I, if only there was a book, all right, that told us stuff that, about this. Spiritual compromise asks God, spiritual compromise is a prayer to God to please punish us. That's what it is. Lord God, I'm tolerating pornography in my life. Please destroy all of my happiness in my marriage. That's what you're asking God. Lord, I'm unjust in my dealings at work. I ask that you ruin my family financially. That's what you're praying, whether you realize it or not. God, I'm cowardly. I don't act as a man in my family. Please ruin my family for generations. Destroy the marriages. Make divorce widespread. Make unhappy women abusive children. Make insecure daughters that marry horrible, abusive men. Amen. That's what you pray when you tolerate spiritual compromise. I'm spiritual, I love Jesus, but I don't go to church. Lord God, please confuse the heck out of me and make my children not know which way is up. I refuse to disciple them because apparently it's called indoctrination. Lord, would you please brainwash them with the world? That's what you're praying. Our actions are often prayers that we don't realize we're praying. And the Israelites' compromise was a call to God a call to actions, a call to arms from God saying, Lord, fulfill your promises in Deuteronomy 28. We promised Joshua that we liked the terms and agreements. We signed our name. Please fulfill it. And so God allowed the enemies that they tolerated to be a thorn in their side and to destroy them. In our day, churches don't do church discipline and they wonder why apostasy becomes normal. They call it exvangelicals, deconversions. No, it's apostasy. You're worse off than an unbeliever. Christians don't, uh, 
don't want to indoctrinate their kids, and they're confused when their kids get indoctrinated by the world or TikTok. Pastors don't preach the word, and they wonder why unbelief is on the rise. The only kind of Christian faithfulness normalized in the scriptures is a militant, missional, forward-marching one. Compromise and cowardice is demonic. Christ is Lord, and everything else will be crushed or placed under his feet. That's how it works. And as we said before, deal with it. Chapter 2 then goes on. If we look at verse 6, it recaps the death of Joshua. He was good, that was good, but time passed. And then we arrive at verse 11, which says, And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. Baal and the Baals were fake gods. They were demon gods. They were fertility gods. Like, you worship him right and he'll help your fields grow. That kind of god. And, verse 12, they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers. That's always the case. People think we can tolerate a little bit of other gods, right? Buddha gets a quote on the bulletin. That's okay. Uh, Islam gets a nod of the hat. You know, we're going to coexist. The first thing to go once you try and tolerate all religions is true Christianity. The Israelites thought, we love Yahweh, we'll keep Yahweh, he's real handy, we're just going to also worship Baal. Next sentence, they abandoned the Lord. Because demons are monotheists just like the real God is. Uh, Demons are jealous for exclusivity just like the real God is. It's just that one of them is going to be judged in eternal fire and the other one will be doing the judging and we need to pick our sides now. So verse 14 then becomes the effect. Look at what verse 14 in chapter 2 says. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. How patient God is. You've read Genesis 6, right? The next verse is going to be that he sent a global flood and killed everybody. No. No, he's even more merciful than that. He's going to keep his promises. He never breaks a promise. The Israelites break promises. You and I break promises. God never does. There's a rainbow in the sky above the Israelites every time it rains that reminds them he's not going to flood everybody, even though they're this wicked and history is this ugly. What a merciful God. But the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them. Yeah, that's what plunderers do. That's a funny phrase. And he sold them into the land of the surrounding enemies so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. So now it's not even that they're in the land alongside the enemies. Now they're overrun by the enemies. That's always how it happens. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm, as the Lord had warned, and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were in terrible distress. Well, that's the overview of the book, really, coming on into uh, verse 16. This uh, is telling us in chapter 1, basically the overview of the whole book from here on is, here's our introduction. Judah did okay, everybody else failed, and Judah wasn't even perfect. Everyone else failed, they tolerated the enemies, the enemies overcame them, the Israelites worshipped the false gods, God abandoned them, they abandoned God, true religion was nowhere to be found in the land, it just looked pagan again. You could have gone in 10 years after the conquest or 10 years before the conquest and you couldn't have told that there was the true religious people of God that had come in. They looked just as pagan as ever. It's like going into a church or going into a nightclub and trying real hard to figure out which one you've just walked into. Ever been to one of those? That's the cycle. And then Judges 19 shows us the mercy of God, which again takes up a cyclic a cyclical uh, uh, pattern. So look at verse 16 of chapter 2. But the Lord raised up judges. He raised up leaders, military leaders usually, for his people who would be endowed with strength and anointed of God to rescue them. Verse 16, then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. What What a merciful God. Yet they did not listen to the judges. Are you kidding me? I thought we had some, we were going up and it's just making more momentum to come back down again. But they did not listen to their judges for they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. They turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord and they did not do so. Verse 18, whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. 
For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. But whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them, bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he said, because this people have transgressed my covenant that I commanded their fathers and have not obeyed my voice, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations." This is the cycle. You've got to get used to this cycle. We're going to be in it for the next 11 weeks. Uh, there is distress because they compromised. They allowed the enemy in. The enemy overwhelms them. They cry out to God in, mer- in, in, in desperation. God hears in mercy and raises up a judge. There's revival. And then the judge dies and the revival reverses. They go back to their whoring and their idolatry and compromise. The enemies are strengthened by God. God strengthens their enemies. They start dying in large number. They cry to God. God is merciful and raises up a judge who is usually a piece of work. And then he saves them. And then they are praising God. Then he dies and then they return to their idolatry. This is the entirety of the book of Judges to come. And the writer puts this in the beginning as a, just don't expect any positives. But this, is, this, is the, this is like the preface to the book. It gets dark. And it gets worse each round, each chapter, harder to read than the last. And one example that we can look at uh, in chapter 3, verse 7, there's almost no details about how it happens or what he's like. So we'll just read it, in its, um, it from verse 7 to 11 and see that this is an example of what we're going to be reading in the rest of the book. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. That's a common phrase in this book. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asheroths. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the people of Israel served Cushan Rishathaim eight years. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, Right? His uncle was in the military. His uncle was one of the spies that came to the land. His uncle was Caleb, Joshua's friend. His uncle was a hero of the faith. His uncle told amazing military miracle stories around the fire at night at, at, the, at, the, uh, at, at Caleb's house and at his family ranch. That's amazing. No wonder Othniel had patriotic, righteous zeal flowing through his veins. Tell your kids the good stories. Okay, uh, and so Othniel, the spirit of the Lord was upon him and he judged Israel. That is, he, he led, he decided on, on righteous legal matters. He led them well. He went out to war and the Lord gave Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand and his hand prevailed over Cushan. Why does it say it so many times? Cushan Rishathaim, so the land had rest for 40 years, then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. That is a long period of reign in terms of the judges. And that is basically as positive as it gets. But that's the cycle. Now, I've said nothing about our modern day or the lessons that the churches can learn, have I? So here's some... (laughs) The second question we've been asking after, what happened? Well, well, that's our intro. That's what was happening. Our second round of questions is this. What examples might we learn for faithful obedience in our day? We can learn this. Number one, spiritual obedience most of the time looks very physical. I remember yesterday, men, about Gnosticism, breeding pietism in the church. That, that to be spiritual and to be godly will usually mean you do very little. All of your investment is in this invisible, intangible, ethereal, spiritual plane. That's Gnosticism. That's pagan religion. God's true religion means that there's usually immediate acts of obedience done in the physical realm that need to be done now that you stand up, take something on the chin, take something in the hand and start waging in brackets, spiritual warfare and spiritually slicing up God's enemies. Spiritual obedience 
actually most of the time looks very physical. Because most of the things in our world are spiritual and more spiritual than you realize. So, death to Gnosticism, leave no room for pietism in our religion. I I remember hearing this story about a deacon in a church who gets up mid-service, draws a revolver, and pops three bullets in this guy's chest mid-service because the guy had started to pull out a machine gun and walk towards the front. Praise God for that guy. What made me really angry was all the Christian blogs about how he didn't pursue a non-violent solution to the guy sitting around my kids with an AK-47. Those guys don't deserve deacons like that in their churches. How pietistic. Their children should probably be shot at instead of a violent solution coming around. You know what side of the table they would have been on in the book of Judges. In the Asheroth temple, dancing with the Baal priestesses. That's where. So death to Gnosticism, we need full-orbed physical and spiritual Christianity. Here's a second application that I took to heart this week. God uses idiots. I can't tell you how much of an encouragement that is to me. I first wrote fools because that's more of a biblical word, but it's meant to be an offensive. It means idiots. I am so glad that God uses people that speak before they think, that do stupid things, that have sinned in their past and will sin in their future. Aren't you thankful for that? You read the book of Judges and you say, thank you, Lord. Your purposes don't fail just because we are evil and stupid. (laughs) Amen, someone. All right. Thirdly, God's purposes in history are not static, but constantly require his active involvement, which we call revival. It's never enough for any generation, and I'm preaching to this generation, to say we're so thankful that God did X, Y, Z. I read Spurgeon. I read the Puritans. I read the Reformation. I read revivals in the 1850s. I read about Billy Graham and those crusades, and I've heard amazing stories. Good job. Your Uncle Caleb saw miracles. Are you the Othniel? What about in our day? We need to turn to the Lord because of the purposes of God are Uh, Do not continue on without the people of God. God has so married his purposes to his people that if the people don't continue on, if they all fall into compromise, his purposes fall flat. Praise God for his promises that he will not let that happen absolutely. And yet we need to realize that if we want to see God's purposes advance, it requires every generation And the call is on us until we see it in a mighty number. It requires every generation to call to God and say, please do it again in our day. In these days, we call that revival. Please, God, wake us up. Shake the household of God. Clear out all of the false and foolish leaders. Strengthen your people to put on strength and go in great commission warfare like the days of our forefathers, like Joshua, who took the land, who established righteousness. Every age and every generation needs to see that God's purposes, not being static, require constant re-exhilaration by his mighty miraculous hand, and that we call revival. Here's our third question for tonight. How does this story, or this introduction at least, move forward or contribute to God's redemptive plan throughout history? The overwhelming theme of this two chapters has been the failure of Israel to fulfill their promises to God, the failure of Israel to occupy their land, even to the point of judgment, the failure of the humans in the scenario and in the equation to fulfill their covenant to God. That's the overwhelming theme to which the book of Judges demands that we ask the question. So God's purposes are going to fail, right? His promises were well-intentioned. He had a great plan. He forgot to factor in human sin. Right? The answer that the book of Judges points us forwards to 1 and 2 Samuel, when the kings come. The book of Judges points us forward to other positive things that happen in God's history, including discipline of the Israelites, but then eventually the sending of the Messiah. But as we read Old Testament history, Judges is a dark point that you would expect would result in abject failure and God washing his hands of this whole Israel experiment. But God is more powerful and gracious than our sins are destructive and foolish. 
so that even the failure of the human individuals, and even though human individuals failed to in- obtain the promises, God would not see that his promises would entirely fail. They would never fail. Individuals would fail to obtain them, but his promises to the nation were held on. And eventually there was, there was enough, the Bible calls this the remnant. There was enough Israelites that God held off judgment or that he sent salvation. There was enough praying that he sent a judge. There was enough staying true to worship that he kept his promises to them until such a time as the Messiah would come and salvation and grace be unleashed on the world through the cross of Jesus Christ. The redemption plan of God is shown to persevere though humans fail and sin. And how does this point us to Jesus Christ ultimately? How does this story, this introduction, this hopeless story point us to Jesus? Revelation chapter 19 verse 11 tells us of a vision of John the Apostle. And he looks to the sky and he sees Jesus riding a horse. And it says, in righteousness he judges and makes war. Jesus is the ultimate spiritual, divine God-man who God raises up as a judge to bring salvation to his people. He doesn't fail by turning to idols. He isn't afraid. He doesn't cowardly back off when the spiritual authorities in his day, either demons and the devil in the desert, or the Pharisees and the, the, the liberal compromisers in religion as they surround him in the temple. He listens to them patiently while he braids a whip and then chases them and whips them. He is not afraid of the human authority. He faces up to Pilate and takes it on his shoulders as he kills him. But ultimately, as the judge who makes war in righteousness and as he judges, his ultimate act of deliverance and salvation was that he represented sinful Israel, who represents you and I. And he went before God, and instead of just defeating enemies, he was treated as an enemy. He didn't just save the nation politically, he received the judgment from God on the cross at Easter that we all deserve. Even though we could religiously call ourselves God's people, we're all guilty and we all deserve judgment. Jesus is the judge who comes and takes our judgment And he at no point compromises, he at no point sins, he at no point fails. He perfectly accomplishes the task that God gave him to do because he is the saviour of all sinners, anyone who believes in him. And where the old judges would then die, and now there's no saviour, and so they return to their sin, Jesus lives in an indestructible, eternal life now, constantly protecting us, constantly the great example, constantly leading us and keeping us safe to take us home to heaven. He is the indestructible, righteous, warring judge. And Isaiah chapter 9 says that of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Justice and righteousness from this time forth will be his to establish and uphold. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Jesus is the leader, the savior, the judge that doesn't fail. That's what Judges tells us. That's the desperate taste in the mouth that Judges demands, that that, that makes you ask, will there be none come from God and remain perfect? Yes, his name is Jesus. But just as Jesus dies for his enemies and dies for his people, and just as Jesus didn't compromise with his enemies, Jesus will come back a second time and he won't tolerate a coexistence with his enemies in, in the new world. That means that if you have not laid aside your spiritual sins, your idolatry, your your whorings, your your crimes, your rebellions against God, if you've not trusted Jesus alone for your salvation, said, I'm reading Judges, that's my kind of sin. I'm that kind of sinner. Is that that kind of salvation for me? Yes, only in Jesus. But if you reject him and you continue to stay as an enemy to him, holding either to another religion or refusing what the Bible calls the one way to heaven, One day Jesus will come back, mercy will be done away with, and you will meet him as a militaristic enemy. You will lose, you will go to hell and pay for your sins forever. Jesus doesn't tolerate his enemies in the greater and better Israel in heaven. So repent now. Believe upon Jesus while he's held out to you as a merciful savior who gives his life in love. Let's pray. God, thank you for the book of Judges. 
Please bless our time over the weeks as we study this. Give us real, uh, tangible, physical acts in our time, in our day, that we can do in order to establish righteousness, that we might, like Jesus, judge and make war in righteousness. Lord, please remove from us any, any misplaced zeal or any sinful anger of man that is natural to our own sinful flesh. And Lord God, put into us a zealous, righteous anger, a, a zeal to see your laws upheld, your gospel go forward, souls added to the kingdom and your church put on strength to the glory of God the Father and the head of the church, Jesus Christ, who gives us his spirit for these things. We pray, Lord God, that you would inspire in each one of us uh, applications for our own life, our own home, our own family, our own day, and our own soul. Give us, Lord God, application from this book of Judges so that we are not in a microcosm. We are not in a small sense what Israel in the book of Judges was as a whole nation. Make us not compromisers, Lord God. Give us the zeal that slices sin out of the portions of our heart and out of the lands of our soul that we might be entirely devoted to you and doing your will to your glory. We pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen.